जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारे गोपी जन वल्लभा गिरिवार धारे जय राधा
जगन्नाथ जगन्नाथ बलदेवा जय सुभद्र जय जगन्नाथ जय बलदेव जय सुभद्र रानी की जय पतित पावन निताय गौर चंद्र की भगवान की जय शील प्रभुपाद की जय ऑल ग्लोरिस्ट दी असेंबल्ड डिवोटीज हरे कृष्णा ऑल ग्लोरिस्ट दी असेंबल्ड डिवोटीज हरे कृष्णा ऑल ग्लोरिस्ट दी असेंबल्ड डिवोटीज हरे कृष्णा ऑल ग्लोरिस्ट टू श्री गुरु एंड श्री गौरांग एंड ऑल ग्लोरिस्ट टू यू शील प्रभुपाद गुरवे गौरचंद्रा राधिकाए तदाल कृष्णा कृष्णभक्ताय तद्भक्ताय नमो नम ओम ज्ञानतिरंध से ज्ञानाजनशलाकय चक्षुरोन्मील ये नस्म श्रीगुरव नम श्रीचैतन्यमनोभीष्ट स्थापित ये नूतले स्वयं रूपा कदा मह्यम ददा स्वादाक नमा विष्णुपादाय कृष्ण प्रेष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वतदेव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशतारिणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभो निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर श्रीवासदी गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे मुखम करोति वाचालम पंगुम लंगयते गिरिम यत कृपा तम हम वंदे श्री गुरुम दीनतारिणम परमानंद माधवम श्री चैतन्य ईश्वर फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई ऑफर माय ओबेसेंसेस थाउजेंड्स एंड थाउजेंड्स ऑफ टाइम्स at the lotus feet of the founder acharya of the international society for krishna consciousness ac bhakti vedanta swami shila prabhupad by whose causeless mercy the nectar of bhagavad gita as it is has spread far and wide in this dark age of kali i bow down repeatedly at the lotus feet of all the self effulgent self realized acharyas in our exalted brahma madhva mad brahma madhva gaudiya parampara and last but not the least i bow down at the lotus feet of all the assembled vaishnavas and vaishnavis by your kind blessings and heartfelt best wishes may the right words come at the right time in the right spirit in the glorification of shri krishna 
and the purification of myself. Please accept my humble obeisances and offer your blessings. Vansha kalpatarubhyascha kripa sindhu vyayivacha patitanam pavane bhyo Hare Krishna. Happy to be back. <laughs> so, after separation of 10 months, probably, left in March, so it's about nine months. So, back here in the beautiful kingdom of Radha Gopi Vallabha to serve all the devotees here. Thank you, Ganga Prabhu, for hosting us. Not just opening the not just opening the doors of your house, but the doors of your heart to all of us on this most auspicious occasion of Ekadashi. Ekadashi is called as Madhava Tithi. Tithi means the most auspicious timing, date and time. And Madhava is Krishna. Mm -hmm. So if Krishna has to manifest in the form of wood, it is Jagannath. If Krishna has to manifest in the form of stone, it is the deity. If Krishna has to manifest in the form of the piece of land, it is Vrindavan. If Krishna has to manifest in the form of sound, it is the holy name. If Krishna has to manifest in the form of water, it is Ganga or Yamuna. If Krishna has to manifest in the form of a personality, it is Sri Guru. If Krishna has to manifest in the form of the book, it is Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam. And if Krishna has to manifest in the form of time, it is Ekadashi. So therefore it's called as Madhava Tithi. Hmm? This is also called as Hari Vasaraha, the day when Hari, Sri Krishna, resides completely. Vasaraha means to reside and Hari is Krishna. This day is called Ekadashi because this is the 11th day in the fortnight. Every month has 30 days, which means two fortnights of 15 days each. And the 11th day, Eka means one and Dasha means 10, and one plus 10 is 11. So the 11th day out of the 15 in the waxing and the waning, so 11th and 11th from here, it's called Ekadashi. But we do Upavas on this day. Upavas means fasting. Hmm? We fast from grains and beans. But this is a very uh, external meaning of fasting on the day of Ekadashi. Hmm? <laughs> the true meaning of <laughs> one's Bhagavad Gita, I guess. <laughs> the true meaning of Ekadashi Upavas means Upa means closer hmm? and Vasa means to reside. So Upavas means to stay close to someone or to sit at the feet of someone. Who is that? Krishna. And how do we sit close to Krishna on this day? Ekadashi. Eka means one and Dasha means ten. One plus ten is eleven, which means eleven senses. Hmm? <laughs> you're <a> fan. Sorry? <laughs> you're <a> fan. <laughs> yeah, one animal has another. <laughs> <laughs> so I said sit close to, so it's sitting pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh Krishna, <laughs> blatantly truthful. Um, so Ekadashi, Eka means one and Dasha means ten, which means eleven senses. We have five knowledge acquiring senses and five working senses. Five plus five is ten and the king of all the senses, that's the mind. So five plus five, ten plus one, eleven. So through all of these eleven senses, to sit close to Krishna on this day is Ekadashi Upavas. Hmm? It's a very powerful day. On the day of Ekadashi, those who don't uh, take beans and grains and chant as much as possible and remember Krishna and hear Hari Katha, they don't enter another mother's womb again. Padma Puran, Skanda Puran, Garga Samhita, Brahma Vaivarta Puran, all of these scriptures give profound evidence on the glories of Ekadashi. So it's very wonderful and it's, it's a matter of fortune that on the day of Ekadashi, we're not just a devotee and observing Ekadashi, we're sitting with devotees and observing Ekadashi. After millions and billions and trillions of births, we get one human form. 
and probably after millions and billions and trillions of human forms, we become a devotee. Not just become a devotee, then meet another devotee and meet an association, a congregation of devotees, and all of them hearing Hari Katha on the day of Ekadashi. This is really rare. The scriptures describe even Brahma, even Indra, Chandra, Agni, Vayu, Varuna, all the demigods. They perform yajna to become a devotee in the human form on earth. So the fortune that has fallen on our lap is indeed a, a very rare fortune. And especially to sit amidst Vaishnavas and hear and chant and remember Krishna at the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna here, it's indeed very rare. So please give me your permission so that I can speak some favorable words today to purify myself hmm, by speaking some Hari Katha. Hare Krishna. So we will read from the Sri Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, text 9. This is a very famous verse. In fact, in one room conversation, Prabhupada was asking his disciples, so what is the, uh, the best verse of Bhagavad Gita? And somebody said, uh, Sarva Dharman Parityajya. Prabhupada said, no. And somebody else said, Dharma Kshetra Kuru Kshetra. That's the first verse. Prabhupada said, no. Hmm? Somebody else said, some Dehi no Dehi. Prabhupada said, no. Then finally Prabhupada said, in my opinion, the best verse of Bhagavad Gita is chapter 4, text 9. Where Krishna says, once you know about my appearance and my activities, you don't enter another mother's womb again. So that's like a secret to avoid and break through the cycle of birth and death. So let's read that verse. Yeah? Please kindly repeat. Janma karma chame divyam Evam yo vetti tattvataha Yaktva deham punar janma Naiti mameti sorjuna Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada this is a very beautiful verse. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take another birth again in this material world but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna. So that's like a secret to go back to the spiritual world and never again see this material world again. Just to know the transcendental nature of Krishna's appearance and activity. This is a long purport, so I'll just read the first portion of it. And the rest we can always read it at home. Purport. The Lord's descent from his transcendental abode is already explained in the sixth verse. One who can understand the truth of the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is already liberated from material bondage and therefore he returns to the kingdom of God immediately after quitting his present material body. Such liberation of the living entity from material bondage is not at all easy. It's a very powerful statement. I repeat here. Prabhupada says such liberation for the living entity from material bondage is not at all easy which means to get Krishna mm, to break the cycle of karma, to break the cycle of reincarnation, mm, is very difficult. The impersonalists and the yogis attain liberation only after much trouble and many, many births. Even then, the liberation they achieve, merging into the impersonal Brahma Jyoti, which means the light effulgence of the Lord. Mm, like you have an electric bulb and then you have the light which comes out of it. Yeah. So Krishna is like the bulb, the personality, while the electric, the, the light effulgence that covers hmm, our vision towards the actual filament hmm, is the Brahma Jyoti of Krishna, Krishna's light effulgence. So merging into the impersonal Brahma Jyoti of the Lord is only partial and there is a risk of returning to this material world. But hmm, the devotee, simply by understanding the transcendental nature of the body and activities of the Lord attains the abode of the Lord and after ending this body does not run the risk of returning to this material world. So I'll stop here. So this Bhagavad Gita is a, is a very sweet work in the sense because the Vedas emanate from the breathing of Mahavishnu. Hmm? 
But Bhagavad Gita comes from the lips of Krishna. It's very rare. Because other transcendental knowledge all manifest from the breathing of the four-handed Mahavishnu. But the Supreme Personality of God, it's Sri Krishna, this doesn't even come from his breathing, it comes from his lips, straight from the horse mouth. Because Krishna also has a horse incarnation, by the way. <laughs> I agree, Bhavata. So, <clears throat> so this is coming from Krishna's lips and spans 700 verses in 18 chapters. This was spoken with Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra in less than 48 straight minutes. So it was not like they parked the chariot and said, let's go out for three days and discuss Bhagavad Gita and come back. <laughs> this, was, this was a quick pep talk because Arjuna was losing his composure and Krishna spoke. Interesting question. Why was this not spoken in a temple setting? Why was this not spoken up in a, in a very quiet cave, a meditative yoga studio? This was spoken on a battlefield. Because if this was spoken in a quiet setup, we could say, well, it's easy for Krishna to speak and for Arjuna to understand because they have a quiet setting. My life is not quiet. I have a battle almost every day. So Krishna understands that. We all live our own Kurukshetras every single day. It's noisy, by the way. We have horses around. We have chariots around. We have conch shells blowing. We have sword fighting, mental sword fighting with people. So the life that we're leading is almost like a Kurukshetra, each one of us. And we wouldn't walk up to Krishna and ask for solutions to our problems because first of all, we don't even think we are in a problem. So Arjuna, although he's a pure Vaishnav, on our behalf, he stands up there and says, wait a minute, I'm in, an, I'm in the middle of a problem. This is a battlefield. Everything is noisy. The horses are making sound. The conch shells are blowing. And I am confused. I am baffled. There's bewilderment of intellect. Krishna, please help me what to do. By the way, this is the same Arjuna who could shoot the eye of a spinning, moving fish by looking at the reflection. This is the same Arjuna who said, I can probably control the raging wind. How can he ever have a problem? How can he be confused? How can he be bewildered? The answer is, he wasn't confused. He wasn't bewildered. We are all bewildered. Because Arjuna is para dukkha dukhi. As a devotee is, is merciful. He becomes sad seeing others sad. So he understood that people, all of us, Kaliuga Jeevas, we are going to be in the problem in the battlefield of daily life and we are not going to ask Krishna for solutions. So he walks up to Krishna and says, Krishna, I am confused. Please help me. So that through the knowledge that Krishna provides, those who hear this epic narration, they can take benefit. Oftentimes people ask this question, by hearing Bhagavad Gita, will my problems go away? The answer is no. The problems will never go away. Sometimes we find the problems multiply. I've heard some people say, I was better off before I became a devotee. <laughs> Once I became a devotee, my problems quadrupled. <laughs> this is true. But why is this true? Because if you have a room which is dirty and untouched for years, we don't even know how dirty it is. But when we open it up and start the cleaning process, that's when all the dust starts rising up. And you feel it's really dirty. You start coughing and sneezing. But only if we continue for another hour cleaning up, the room would be spick and span, very clean. So similarly, our heart has not been cleansed for billions and billions of lifetimes. So when you start hearing the Bhagavad Gita, the churning process, the cleaning process has begun. So all the dust, all the anarthas will start rising up. We would see, well, the anger, the lust, the greed, the envy has risen much before. Hmm? Before I was calm and composed. But after I started hearing Bhagavad Gita, I have become more angry than before. That's true. Because these anarthas are coming up to the brim, up to the surface. But only if we continue hearing they will all be washed away. Just like we find in the famous churning of the milk ocean pastime. Hmm? The nectar is there, but when they start churning up, what's the first commodity that rises to the surface? It's poison. So the nectar of love for Krishna is there in our heart, but that, that's not gonna rise in like six months of chanting Hare Krishna. 
when you start churning, the first thing that comes out is poison. But if you stop the churning process, we are satisfied with the poison. But if you continue the churning process, the poison is taken away by Lord Shiva, which means pure Vaishnavas. And then you have different jewels coming up. Finally, the, the nectar coming up. So this Bhagavad Gita, which is described, must be read every day. Yatra Gita vicharascha patanam patanam tatha modate tatra Shri Krishna Bhagavan Radhayasaha. It's described in the glories of the Bhagavad Gita. Wherever Bhagavad Gita is heard, taught, learnt, and contemplated upon, in that specific place, Modate Tatra Shri Krishna, Krishna appears there in a very pleasing, smiling way. Alone? No. Radhayasaha, with Radharani. So wherever Bhagavad Gita is heard, taught, learnt, contemplated, meditated upon, that is the place where Radha and Krishna manifest in a very pleasing, smiling way. So now let's discuss on this verse. Hmm? For it's about eight o'clock. Can I go to eight forty-five? No limits. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's see how it goes. Yeah. It's not going to be philosophical. It's going to be a long story. Story time. But if we lose track, then we, we lose the whole plot. So it's going to be a long narration hmm, with different pieces of the puzzle, which will all come together at the end. So are we all ready? Okay. So Sri Krishna in Dwaraka <clears throat> had different queens, 16,108 prominent queens, oh my God. of which... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Krishna. Oh, Krishna. Yes, indeed. Oh, my God. Indeed. Yes, pretty sweet. Good. In a sense, at its best. So, out of them, the top eight queens are prominent Rukmini, Satyabhama, Jambavati, Nagna Chitti. Lakshmana, etc. So Jambavati and Krishna gave birth to a son by the name Sambha. Hmm? Now those who were in the Yadu dynasty, all of those boys played a prank with Sambha. They dressed him up as a girl, not just a girl, a pregnant girl. Covered his face, her face, <laughs> and she was like a pregnant woman or a pregnant young girl and there were sages coming up. So these boys, these children of the Yadu dynasty went to those sages and said, Oh Sadhu, you can predict the future. You can see past, present and future. Hmm? Trikaladnya. Can you please tell us whether this is going to be a boy or a girl? <laughs> <laughs> they can't have it. Yeah. Can you tell us boy or girl? Now, Vishnu Chakravarti comments here. He says, it's, it's offensive to joke with one's spiritual superior. Hmm? Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur puts a footnote here. He says, it's offensive to cut jokes with one's spiritual superior. Because cutting jokes is the sign of friendship, sakhiras. But with one's superior, one is in servitude. And a servant cannot cut jokes. Especially with one's spiritual superiors, Siksha Gurus, Diksha Gurus, hmm? spiritual, really elevated superiors. We are always at their lotus feet. We cannot cut jokes. They can cut jokes with us, but we still remain at their lotus feet. Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur gives the example. Pandavas, hmm? Yudhishthir Maharaj, Nakula, Sahadev, Arjun, Bhima, what was their relationship with Krishna? They were friends. Why? Because they cut jokes. But Draupadi? She was also a friend because she cut jokes too. Uh -huh. Sakhi. Krishna would call Draupadi Sakhi because she would cut jokes. Krishna's grandparents, they would cut jokes with Krishna and Krishna would cut jokes with them. So although their relationship is that of Vatsalya, it would be uh, 
considered or counted as sakya, friendship, because they cut jokes with each other. So it was very abominable for the boys to cut jokes with these sages. And who was there as the prominent sage? You don't want to cut jokes with him. Durvasa. <laughs> you can cut jokes with anyone, but not Durvasa. Durvasa can make a dead man alive and a live man dead. <laughs> and he can fly. Hmm? I wish I was traveling with uh, Durvasa Muni in the bus because we had so much traffic. <laughs> if I was with him, I could just fly over. But unfortunately, we Kaliuga, we Kaliuga conditioned souls have to go and be stuck in traffic and we are helpless. But Durvasa can just fly over. In Chaitanya Bhagavat, there is a very beautiful story of how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu were doing kirtan on the banks of the Ganga and suddenly a crocodile came out and touched the lotus feet of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and immediately transformed into a young, handsome, beautiful boy. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu asked him, wait a minute, who are you? How did you become a boy? And if you were a boy, how did you become a crocodile? Hmm? So the boy said, I'll tell you my story. Hmm? Now we're going one story inside another. Yeah, yeah pretty much. It's like, like the transcendental inception. Hmm? So he said, when I was this young boy, I was very naughty. Durvasam when he was sitting and meditating, contemplative meditation, and I went with a scissor. I thought, he is not paying attention. Let me go and cut his beard. I can have some fun with the sadhu because he has taken months and years to grow it and it just takes one and it's out. So he went and he went with a scissor and Durvasamuni is deep in meditation and he went and the beard fell off. Durvasamuni opened his eyes and he said, Oh, you have sadistic pleasure by cutting others, by chewing into others. I curse you, you'll be a crocodile. And immediately he became a crocodile. Now the crocodile started crying. He said, look, I'm, I'm just an innocent, funny, mischievous, naughty boy. Now you made me a crocodile. What am I going to do? Okay, okay. The curse cannot be taken back, but I'll reduce the effect. May you be a crocodile in the holy river of Ganga and you... I'm not saying the story because I'm at your place, but I'm, I'm just... It's, just a, it's a story, by the way. <laughs> You will be a crocodile in the holy river of Ganga and you will be delivered when you touch the lotus feet of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu and you will become a boy and you will participate in their Sankirtan movement. So it was a little difficult to understand whether or not it was a blessing or a curse. So you never want to mess up with Durvasa because he can make a man into crocodile and crocodile into man. So they went and asked Durvasa Muni. Oh Durvasa Muni? Can you tell us, this beautiful woman here, will she give birth to a boy or a girl? Durvasamuni, out of his anger, he said, Oh, she will give birth to a lump of iron. And not just that, this lump of iron will destroy the whole Yadu Vamsha. And what is Krishna? He is Yadu Vamshi. He is a Yadava. He is one of the members of the Yadu Vamsha. Which means according to the curse of Durvasa, even Krishna would be destroyed. Hmm? We'll come to this. Hold on. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead? Yes. We will hold on to this. So he said, hmm? we'll give birth to a lump of iron and this will destroy the whole Yadavamsha. The kids started saying, wait a minute, it's just a prank. Don't, don't curse like this. And they started removing Samba's makeup and pregnant makeup and just a boy. But then a lump of iron already came out from the body of Samba. All the kids went to Ugrasen Maharaj. Ugrasen Maharaj is the king of the Yaduvamsha. They went to Ugrasen Maharaj and they said, Oh Maharaj, we just wanted to play a prank with these sadhus. Ugrasen Maharaj, first question, he interrupted and he said, Was Durvasa there by the way? Yeah, he was the sadhu. We went and asked this question. Ugrasen Maharaj started slamming his head to his hand and he said, what are you doing? You don't want to play with Durvasa. What did he say? Oh, he cursed that Samba will give birth to a lump of iron which will finish the whole Yadu Vamsha and you are Yadu Raj. You're the king of the dynasty. 
please give us a solution. How can we save this dynasty? So Ugrasen Maharaj, he said, no problem. Just take this lump of iron, file it down to powder. And the last piece which is present, hmm, take this powder and this last piece and just throw it into the ocean. Nothing will happen. Don't worry. So they did that. But as soon as they did that, inauspicious signs started hovering over the sky and, you know, like thunderstorm and blah, blah, blah. They are considered to be inauspicious. In, in, a, in a Vedic setup, if the king is performing proper dharma, then the rain is in the right quantity at the right time in the right place. You never have like, oh, we're going to have snow today. <laughs> you, know? you never have that in the Vedic culture. It's always <laughs> pretty predictable. Like summertime, you have heat. And winter time, you have cold. And you have proper rain in the proper quantity. You don't have drizzles on Tuesdays and Thursdays and then on a Sunday and then a snowstorm on a Tuesday again. Yeah, this is unheard of. So Ugrasen Maharaj just said, file it up and throw this last piece into the ocean. Nothing will happen. Inauspicious signs started hovering over. So Krishna went to Prabhas. Are we all there in the same story? Or am I disturbing your sleep? <laughs> Feel free to sleep, but just make sure you don't snore, because if you snore, the person next to you will wake up. <laughs> and you don't want to do that. Yeah? <laughs> so Krishna went to Prabhas, which is a place of pilgrimage, and started performing yajna. He wanted to save all of them, but alas, this didn't happen, because the words of Durvasa did come true. All the warriors in the Yaduvamsha, hmm, they started intoxicating. They indulged in alcohol. And as they were drunk completely, there was a small spark in the form of an argument. And in no time, it became a forest fire of fighting and punching and kicking. And they were all looking for weapons. They couldn't find any. So they went to the seashore. And what had happened was, all the iron particles which had been thrown into the ocean were got back to the shore by the waves of the ocean. And in time, those iron particles, because the words of Durvasa have to be kept true, so those iron particles which came back to the shore, with time, started growing up and they became sharp grass of iron. Sometimes you have paper cuts and a sharp blade of grass can cut the finger. That's how sharp it can be. Now you can imagine a grass made of iron, blade of iron. It's going to be really sharp. So all these weapon, all these uh, warriors went there on, on the seashore and they started uprooting these grass, blade of grass of iron and started stabbing each other. And there was bloodshed everywhere. And in no time, every warrior, each and every soldier was killed. The whole Yaduamsha was destroyed. Now what happened to that last piece after filing? That was swallowed by a fish which was caught by a fisherman who opened up the fish and had this piece of iron. He had a friend who was a hunter. And he said, I being a fisherman, I need the fish, but not the last piece of iron. You can keep this just in case if it helps you. So this hunter took that last piece of iron and made a very nice arrowhead for his arrow. Very sharp. And he used it for his purpose. Krishna is in Prabhas performing yajna and the whole Yaduvamsha is destroyed. Krishna sits on the banks of the holy river under a people tree thinking whatever happened happened for the good. Durvasamuni cursed all of them they all died good. Let them just you know get lost <laughs> because they were anyway sinful. As Krishna is sitting he was sitting with his leg over his other thigh, hmm? with his toe pointing outward. And he was sitting under a people tree. So this hunter whom we spoke about, who was the friend of the, the fisherman, he sharpened up his arrow ahead and he came to that place. And Krishna's toe hmm, from behind the tree, from a distance, seemed to be like the face of a deer almost stooping down to drink and sip water from that lake. Is everybody there in the story? 
Yeah? Can I continue? Okay. Because I just have to make sure that I don't go too far. And then the hunter, <coughs> instead of hitting Krishna's toe, has hit one of you. <laughs> yeah? So the hunter, from behind, he just takes a very sharp, close aim, takes the arrow up to his ear, and releases the arrow, thinking to hunt down that deer, which is appearing to sip water from the lake. But alas, alas, what happened? That arrow went and struck Krishna's toe, Krishna's lotus feet. The hunter came to catch the deer. Then he saw Krishna sitting very peacefully, smiling, with his lotus feet having this arrow through his feet. And the hunter says, alas, alas, what did I do? Hmm? What did I do? I should have come here and seen for sure. But I just presumed that this is a deer. Oh, Krishna, please forgive me. Please forgive me for this offense. Krishna said, no problem. This is not any offense. What do you mean this is not an offense? I have hurt you. Your lotus feet is bleeding. Hmm? Krishna was smiling. Krishna said, when I appeared as Sri Ram, you appeared as Vali. You appeared as Vali, the brother of Sugriva. Hmm? Now, that was the first piece of Krishna Leela. Krishna getting struck with the arrow. Now we move a bit and then we come back. Yeah, the second piece. In Rama, Ramchandra's pastimes, we find the story of Vali and Sugriva. Lord, Sug Lord Ramchandra and Sugriva they sign a pact that you help me find my wife and I'll help you find your wife. Because for Sri Ram, Ravana had kidnapped Sita. And for Sugriva, Vali, his own brother, had kidnapped his wife. So Sugriva said, you help me get my wife back by killing Vali. And then I'll help you get Sita. So Ramchandra said, okay, go and challenge Vali for a battle. I'll hide behind a tree and I'll shoot an arrow. No problem, you will be safe. So Griva said, are you sure? Because it shouldn't happen that I go and announce and invite him for a battle and he comes out and powders me into pieces. Are you sure you're going to help me? Yeah, Ramchandra said, yeah, yeah. I'm, go I'm, I'm go here, watching from behind the tree, go fight him. So he went and he called out Wali. Come on, you know, I'm going to hit you down. And Wali thought, my God, what's wrong with this guy? You know, I'm almost like Yamaraj for you. You know that, right? Yeah, yeah, come on. I'm going to teach you. I'm Yamaraj. So Wali comes out and just makes a powder of Sugriva with marks all over Sugriva's face. And Sugriva is looking behind. He can't find Ramchandra. He said, hey, where are you? You give this promise that anyone who comes and takes shelter of you, you protect him. I listen to your advice and I don't know which tree you're hiding behind. I can't find you. So he comes back and he sees Sri Ramchandra and he says, what did you do? You promised me you will help me. But look at my face. My eyes have almost become like Jagannath. <laughs> <laughs> Completely swollen. Hmm? You didn't save me. <laughs> you didn't save me. Ramchandra said, oh, it was you who's getting beaten up. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I was cheering up. I thought it was you beating him up. I didn't know it was he beating you up. I was saying, yes, Sugriva, keep going, keep going, keep going. And I didn't know I'm sorry. Because both of you monkeys look alike. So Sugriva said, this is not fair. I tell you, this is not fair. You tell me to go and challenge him and then look at my face. I'm already a monkey. <laughs> and now I'm considered ugly even among the monkeys. <laughs> please help me. Ramchandra said yes. Oh Lakshmana, please come and offer him a garland. So Lakshmana offered a garland around the neck of Sugriva. Hmm? And Sugriva went and challenged Vali again. Now Ramchandra shot an arrow at the chest of Vali because he could clearly understand that the one with the garland was Sugriva and the one without was Vali and he must be shot down. 
Now, why is this story important for all of us? Sugriva comes and asks Sri Ram, you know everything. Why did you have this pastime of garlanding, this business of Lakshmana garlanding me? Ramchandra said, when Lakshmana and I met you, Lakshman represents Guru Tattva and I represent Bhagavat Tattva, God. Lakshmana is Guru and Ramchandra said, I am God. And you, Sugriva, you're a Jiva. What did you do? When we came to you, you offered me a seat and you kept him standing. So you committed Guru Aparad because of which you had to go through the purification of being beaten up. So when you came back, you were purified, but you still didn't have the mercy of Sri Guru to be protected. So when Sri Guru garlanded you, it was his mercy on you. And now I could protect you. So Ramayana is a very beautiful epic where the pastimes enchant the ear and the lessons enchant the heart. Now going further to our discussion, when Ramchandra shot that arrow, it hit the chest of Vali. And Vali was so powerful that he didn't even move because of the moment of the arrow. He was just standing and the arrow went deep. While being standing, he just removed the arrow which was filled with blood. But it said, Ayodhya Pati Sri Ram. Dasharat Nandan Sri Ram, the son of Dasharat, hmm? Sri Ram. So Vali said, I always wanted to meet Sri Ram, but I didn't know he's such a coward that he would hide behind a tree and shoot me. Oh Sri Ram, why did you kill me? And second, even if you killed me, why did you kill me like this? So Sri Ram came out and he said, you have been hmm, irreligious. You're kidnapping other man's wife and enjoying with her. So I being the representative of the king, I must kill you. It's my duty. So Vali said, that's fine. But why did you kill me like this? You know I'm not a citizen. I'm a monkey. So I can do whatever I want. Hmm? If I was a human, you can punish me. But I'm not a human. I'm a monkey. And monkeys are anyway lusty. So what's the problem? So Ramchandra, he said, oh, if you are a citizen, then I'm the representative of the king. And I killing you is justified. But if you're a monkey, then I'm the hunter. And the hunter always hides behind the tree and shoots the arrow. <laughs> hmm? So Wali said, my lord, may your nectarian sweet words always dance in the courtyard of my heart. I am so happy to see your moonlike face while I die. May I be of your service, to your service, lifetime after lifetime. But Ramchandra is Mariada Purushottam. Hmm? He is a man of uh, proper etiquette and conduct. So to teach the world proper lesson of how karma acts, he told Vali, don't worry, O Vali, tables will turn and this will come back to me. So when Ramchandra became Krishna, Vali became the hunter and got the chance to shoot the arrow from behind the tree. But the point to be understood here is that Krishna or Sri Ram are not under karma. They don't fall under the cycle of karma. Karma doesn't affect Krishna. But Krishna, because he's the spiritual master for the whole world, he's teaching by his example that whatever we say, whatever we do, good or bad, will always come back to us. Must come back as the law of karma. Krishna's teaching by example. Ramchandra is teaching by example. I shot the arrow from behind the tree. Look, I'm ready to take responsibility. Hmm? So this was the first reason why Krishna decided to depart from this world in this fashion. First reason being uh, <clears throat> Durvasa Muni's words that the lump of iron will destroy the whole Yaduvamsha. Second reason, to give chance to Vali. Yeah? Now we'll discuss the third piece. Can I continue? Yes. Okay. Vishwanath Chakravarti gives all of this in his understanding to that verse. Hmm? How Krishna's activity are transcendental. So just hold on. We have the juice of this whole narration coming up at the end. So, yeah. Third piece. When Krishna was ruling Dwaraka, Duruvasamuni again. Sorry, he appears again and again. But Duruvasamuni. He, he tells Krishna and Rukmini, 
that I am coming for prasad. Cook mountains and mountains of feast. I'm sorry, I'm speaking all this on an Ikadashi, but this is how the story is. Durvasa said, cook mountains and mountains of kheer. Hmm? Mountains of rice and lakes and rivers of kheer. Make kochoris, samosas, puri. Hmm? Make all of this. And I'm going to come and honor prasadam. So Krishna and Rukmini worked really hard and they made up all of this. And Durvasa called them up and said, I'm not coming. Then when they were ready with the fact that, yes, he's not coming, he came at 12 o'clock at night and said, I am hungry. And they had nothing. So they said, well, you said you're not coming, so we finished it off. Uh, but you coming, so no problem, you can always come. But what will you have? I will have sweet rice. So Rukmini prepared sweet rice. She was quiet. Krishna was also quiet. They're teaching principles of grihastha dharma. <laughs> Where people like Durvasa can come anytime. So better be prepared. <laughs> so Krishna and Rukmini were ready. They cooked a nice sweet kheer and gave the pot to Durvasa. Now Durvasa said, I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to have it. In fact, make it into two equal pots, half kheer each and give it to Krishna and give it to Rukmini. So both holding pots of kheer, which they themselves cooked at 12.30 in the morning. Hmm? And Krishna said, not inside the palace, come out. So on the street, both of them under the moonlight, they're standing with pot of kheer. Now Krishna and Rukmini asked Durvasa, so what are we supposed to do this, eat? Durvasa said, no, put your hand into it and smear it all over your body. So Krishna put his hand into the pot of kheer and started smearing all over his face. Hmm? Now Rukmini is the wife, so she is looking over and she also starts doing it all over her body. After this, Durvasa says, I want to drive Krishna's chariot. It's probably one o'clock at night. Hmm? I want to drive Krishna's chariot. So they get Krishna's chariot and the chariot driver is Daruka. Hmm? Not the one who maintains Radha Kalachanji's kitchen. Yeah? Daruka is Krishna's chariot driver. So uh, Durvasa says, I want to drive this chariot. So Ch Daruka comes, he says, no, Daruka should leave. He should leave and release all the horses. So the chariot is almost like this, with Durvasa standing here. Then he goes on to say, O Rukmini, Come, pick up the chariot and start walking. So imagine, you make a big feast for Durvasa and he's not coming. And then when you distribute it, he comes at 12 o'clock at night and asks for sweet rice, which you make and he doesn't have it, gives you the pot and asks you not to eat, but to smear it on the body. Then ask for your chariot without the chariot driver, release, horses release, and then ask your wife, Rukmini, to come and pull the chariot. So she goes down and then she just collapses because it's, well, you know, it's a big chariot. When she collapses, she tries three times. Then she finally collapses, sweating. The Ruasa says, okay, I'm impressed. I'm happy. Now I give you my benediction. He said, wherever you smeared your sweet rice, you'll be invincible there. But Krishna... You didn't listen to my advice completely. You smeared kheer all over your body, except the sole of your feet. So you'll be vulnerable there. Mm. But the whole body, you'll be invincible. So to full, this was the third reason. First, the point of Durvasa, where the lump of iron would destroy Yaduvamsha. And Krishna being a Yaduvamshi, agreed by the words of Durvasa. Second, he gave chance to Wali to become the hunter Hmm? To show the world how law of karma acts. Quote, unquote, doesn't act on Krishna. But Krishna is showing it as example. Third piece. Again, Durvasa. Durvasa said, wherever you smear sweet rice, you will be invincible. But because you didn't smear it. Hmm? Like, by the way, Draupadi had, um, Rukmini had smeared it all down, even on the sole of her feet. But Krishna didn't. 
Hmm? So the Ruasa said, you didn't listen to my advice completely, my instruction. So wherever you smeared kheer or sweet rice, you will be invincible. But at the sole of the feet, you will be vulnerable. So this was the third reason why Krishna decided to disappear in the fashion that he did. Now, now the fourth piece. Is everybody there? Okay. Ekadashi, so we're meeting after a long time, so I thought, let's boil the milk a bit. <laughs> so this is the fourth piece now. <laughs> Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur talks about a story. So we put these three pieces, keep them separate. This is a fresh piece now, not connected with that. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur speaks about the story of a very beautiful kingdom. And in this kingdom, the king, queen, and all the uh, different ministers, they call in different performers. One weekend it's the singers, the other weekend it's the dancers, the third weekend are other performers of art and dance and music and drama. And one weekend, it's the magic show. Yeah, This weekend it's the magic show. So the magician comes in and he comes with his mridanga. So he comes with his beats hmm? and his wife comes in. She ties a tightrope, two poles and a tightrope. She climbs onto it and she, wrong, she dances. <laughs> yes, on the tightrope and he changes the beats and she changes her dance step. And all of this with how many pots? <laughs> Wrong, six pots. <laughs> <laughs> so with six pots, one over the other, she dances on a tightrope. And as he changes the rhythm, he speeds it up, has a breakdown and a melt over and things like that. And she changes her dance accordingly. Everybody is clapping. She's so skilled. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is giving this story. So everybody is clapping. The queen is so impressed that she pulls out a diamond necklace that she's wearing, goes and gives it to this wife and says, This is for your performance. The king comes in and you know pulls out a gold chain that he's wearing and gives it to the magician. Now both the parents have it, but children, they have two kids as well. They're just watching. What, what is there for us? Well, the king says, you didn't perform. So they are angry. One goes to the mother and starts pulling the diamond necklace. The other goes to the father and starts pulling the gold chain. He can get it from the father, but the mother is a little soft-hearted. So the second brother manages to pull out the diamond necklace. Now this brother finds it. Well, is it easier for me to pull it out from the father? the gold chain, or is it easy for me to pull a diamond necklace from the hands of my brother? <laughs> I have a younger brother, so I know how brothers interact. It starts in a, in a kind of humble way, and in, in about five minutes, it's Kurukshetra. <laughs> <laughs> He's not here, so. <laughs> so this brother goes to the, the other brother and starts pulling. Hmm? The diamond chain, uh, the diamond necklace. And in no time there's a real, you know, passionate fight. And one doesn't want to give, the other wants to pull. And in the fit of that moment, both the brothers pick out and remove knives. Because both are tribals. They are like tribal village magicians. So they remove their knives. And they go out and stab each other. Both the brothers stab each other and there's a pool of blood. Both brothers are dead. So the mother is thinking, I danced. I got this diamond necklace not to lose my children like this. What am I going to do without my children? So she took that knife and she killed herself. And the magician who got his wife and his children, he was shocked. What is happening? 
He ate him with the knife. He said, I can't live without my family. This pool of blood. He went and killed himself. So in no time, the crowd became so morose and grave that after a fantastic magical performance, there were four bodies in a pool of blood. The king ordered all the four bodies to be cremated and the place to be cleaned properly. So all the blood was removed and all the bodies were cremated. And everything was suspended. Everybody became so disturbed. They couldn't sleep at night. They all went back to their homes. Started thinking, he was so good. Why did they mess it up? Some started saying they were greedy. The others started saying, no, it's the queen's mistake. Why did she give it in public? Everybody was morose. In a week's time, the king gets a handwritten letter. The king gets a handwritten letter from the magician. <laughs> and the magician writes this letter saying, well, you gave us gifts and presents for our first act. What about the second? <laughs> what about the second? And if you don't believe, this is our address. We are all healthy, wealthy, and wise. Please come and meet us. So the king makes a big public announcement. And with his own whole kingdom, he goes there. They're all playing kettle drums and bugles and instruments. They're all going there. And they find the kids are playing in the garden. And the wife is cooking in the kitchen. And the magician husband opens the door. Yes, how can I serve you? He said, wait a minute, I thought you are all gone. He said, there's a reason why we're all called magicians. And this is not just an old story of the past. This is possible hmm, by magicians even of the present. India had a very, very profound and a famous magician called P.C. Sarkar. Hmm? Now, during the British era, P.C. Sarkar was given a chance to perform. Now, we're talking about, you know, like many, many decades ago. So the British said, we drink tea from 4 to 6 in the evening. Those are the two hours we have. So why don't you come and perform something during that time? So they all assembled at about 3.45, expecting that as soon as the clock strikes 4, PC Sarkar would come with his act. And they're waiting, 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 waiting. It's 5. And PC Sarkar walks in. They think, hey, what do you think of yourself? We gave you two hours to perform. Our time is precious for us. You walk in one hour late. P.C. Sarkar smiles and he said, my act has already begun. Look at your watch. I was 4-1. So he had hypnotized the whole audience to believe one minute to be one hour. It was just 4-1 and they all thought it was 5 o'clock. So when... You can have magicians of the standard of P.C. Sarkar and the magicians of the standard that we spoke about who they all can kill each other and still be alive. What to speak of Krishna, who is the source of all magicians? What level and what extent and what intensity of magic can Krishna display? Therefore, now the fourth reason for the disappearance. This pastime of Krishna's disappearance is called as Kritrim. Hmm? Kritrim basically means make-believe. It's not true, but it looks true. This disappearance of Krishna is actually a magic pastime where Krishna needs a reason to depart. And he's putting all these one, Duruvasa's point, that all the Yaduvamshis would be destroyed. Two, that Vali should have a time to repay off his karma. Three, the Ruasa's point of the sweet rice not being applied to the sole of the feet. That prophecy. One, two, three should all come out true. And therefore, to orchestrate all of that, the supreme magician Sri Krishna decided to depart the way he did. But it's actually a pastime which Vishwanath Chakravarti calls as Kritrim. It's called as Kritrim or Indrajal. Meaning, hmm, Jal means, uh, uh, what's the right um, translation for Jal? All? Mm, <coughs> no, Jal means um, a net. Hmm? So, Maya Jal means when the conditioned souls are caught in the net of illusion. 
But Indrajal means when Krishna puts a, a net of supreme magic over him. Where you think something is happening, but it's not. <laughs> so this disappearance act of Krishna is actually a make-believe pastime. So we told you piece four of um, the magician story and the PC Sarkar story to give us a sense of appreciation that if magicians with human bodies can do so much, what to speak of Krishna, who's the source of everything that exists. So Krishna's disappearance is a make-believe pastime. It's, it's a, it's a krithrim. Hmm? So oftentimes people, um, they refute by saying, you're worshipping Krishna hmm, who died. But it's not true. This is krithrim. This is make-believe. It appears something, but it's actually something else. So therefore Krishna makes this point that those who understand my activities to be transcendental, in reality, they never take birth again. Hmm? Janma karma chame divyam. So Krishna's disappearance is transcendental and it's um, magical, mystical. Now let's talk about Krishna's appearance. It's another 15 minutes and then we'll wrap up. Because Krishna talks about two things. He says, Janma and Karma Chame Divyam. That my birth and my activities are transcendental. So we spoke about how the activities are transcendental. Now we'll speak about how Krishna's appearance is transcendental. Can I continue? Yes? yes. yes. Are you all awake? Yes. Okay. Now let's see how Krishna's appearance is Divyam. Hmm? And by the way, we are discussing only one-fourth of the verse. Because the verse has four lines, where the first line is Janma Karma Chame Divyam, that the birth, uh, the appearance and the activities are transcendental. Evam Yo Vetti Tatvataha. Second line means anyone who understands this in truth. Third line, Tyaktva Deham Punar Janma Naiti. Such a person, after giving up his body, doesn't appear again. Fourth line, Maam Eti. So Arjuna, he comes to me. So to understand this in truth and never take birth again and go back to Krishna, we discuss the activity. Then we'll discuss now the appearance. So every verse of Bhagavad Gita is filled with so much nectar. It's filled up with so much juice. Hmm? Now let's see Krishna's appearance. Let's have some questions before that. <clears throat> Does time act on Krishna? <laughs> but generally, according to philosophy, no. no, time doesn't act on Krishna. So what's one symptom that time is acting? On Krishna or in general? In general. Aging. Aging, okay. So if you say someone was one year old and became two year old and three year old, is time acting? Did Krishna go from one year to two year to three year to four year to five year? So did time act? <laughs> You're using the right principle, but in the wrong way. <laughs> it's the same, Kalo Asmi. Kalo Asmi, I am time. Okay. But how do we reconcile? When time is acting, you find uh, somebody goes from five years old, because Damodar Leela took place when Krishna was three, while Govardhan Leela took place when Krishna was seven. So de definitely Krishna did age, quote unquote. I'm serving Krishna. Krishna wants to have this uh, pastime since uh -huh. the greatest time is... Serving. Yeah, uh -huh. For us, time acts on us. Yeah. But for Krishna, time is serving. Any other responses? What do you think for this? Is the question uh, un clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah? We're talking about whether or not Krishna ages. It's time. You say magic, you know, things that like it's, it's not true, you know, so it's a pastime, he wants to look like that, he wants to look whatever he wants. <laughs> okay. Krishna just acts like a usual mm. human, so he like an actor. Mm. Okay. Okay. Is material time and time in the spiritual world, are they the same or are they different? You're answering a question by a question. <laughs> That's almost like, you know, facing an interview, he would say, so, you know, what do you think about this? And then we try to clarify and say, oh, so are you asking this or, uh, you know? So, so, <laughs> so, 
So we'll take that at the end, material and spiritual time. But any other responses? Because we find that Krishna grows till 16 and then he doesn't age. So do we say time acts till 16 and doesn't act later? Okay, time never acts. Not on Krishna. Which means he should not age. Time acts on material objects and Krishna's body is transcendental. So how do we reconcile his growing up in age? Because Krishna is eternal, he doesn't move, he doesn't change. In the spiritual world there's no movement. He's of a certain personality, eternal. Because if there's change, it's not eternity. <laughs> Maybe it's eternal change. It's interesting, right? To turn the head on these aspects. Vishnu Chakravarti asked this question and then he answers it. So we're just following the same route. Any other responses to this, this to this question? Anyone from this couch? <laughs> we have different camps. <laughs> okay, here's where Vishnu Chakravarti goes with this. It's very fascinating, but it's going to be a little difficult. But uh, if we patiently hear, it's going to be beautiful. So Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, he says, just like we have um, thousands and thousands of Vaikuntha planets, like the Matsya Loka, Narasinga Loka, Kurma Loka, Varaha Loka, he says there are millions and millions of Goloka planets. Goloka is not just one, one planet where everybody tries to fit in through the same door. Hmm? If hmm, Vaikuntha has millions and billions of planets, what to speak of Goloka? has millions and billions of planets. Now Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur is giving a beautiful secret. He says set one, hmm? let's call it uh, class A, hmm? all of these set of planets in, in class A. All of those planets has Krishna where Krishna is performing pastimes when he is one year old. Then class B has all those planets of Goloka where Krishna is performing pastimes when he is two years old. Then class C has all those planets in Golok Vrindavan where Krishna is three-year-old and he's performing Damodar Leela there. And then this class four or class D, A, B, C, D, where there are un unlimited innumerable planets where Krishna is four years old and then five years old, class E. Then class F, six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, ten-year-old. But we've always understood hmm? That uh, Krishna is 16 year old in the spiritual world, is it not? We always heard that Krishna is 16 years old in the spiritual world. That's because in our Gaudiya Sampradaya, we are followers of Radha and Krishna. And Radharani appears where Krishna has attained Yauvana Avastha, where he is um, youthful. So when Krishna is one year old, the interaction of Radha and Krishna hmm, is not uh, the prominent pastime. The prominent pastime is there is Yashoda and Krishna. So in Gaudiya Sampradaya, we are followers of Radha and Krishna. So therefore, the Gaudiya Acharyas, they say Krishna 16 year old. Because in that, that's the age where Krishna is interacting with Radharani in those set of planets. Hmm? Is this understandable? Mm -hmm. Class A, innumerable planets where Krishna is performing pastimes where he's one year old, two year old, three year old, four year old, five year old, six year old. Now, when Krishna decides to descend in this world, Krishna from class A, where he's one year old, he descends. He performs pastime for one year, and then he disappears, and the two-year-old Krishna comes. And then he performs pastime for a year, and he disappears, and the three-year-old three Krishna comes. And then he disappears, and four-year-old Krishna comes from that set. And then from E, five-year-old Krishna comes. And then six-year-old Krishna. And then seven-year-old Krishna. So to the naked eye, it seems as if Krishna is going from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But actually, one is eternal. It's from that set. 
of one-year-old pastimes. Two is eternal. It's coming from class B, where Krishna is two-year-old. Is this understandable? Or is it confusing? Confused? Siddhanta Valiya Chitte Nakara Alas. Iha Hoite Krishna Lagya Sudrida Manas. Kaviraj Goswami said, Tattva is going to be a little uh, head racking. But if we don't get into it, our heart will not be attached to Krishna. So we have to put in a little effort. We all come together and we, on the day of Ekadashi, we can try. So, in a set of planets where Krishna is performing the pastimes of one year old, that Krishna drops down and performs the pastime from appearance to one year old. And then, as soon as on his first birthday, he disappears and the two year old Krishna replaces him. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, to the naked eye, it seems as if Krishna is growing up, but actually, he's not. Each of those Krishnas are manifesting. So time is not acting. Time is not acting. Hmm? He's growing up to the naked eye. But actually there are different Krishnas dropping. I mean the same Krishna, but from different manifestations. It's the same Krishna. There's only one Krishna. But he's manifesting different ages. So for those who like Damodar Leela, hmm, and those who want to serve Krishna <clears throat> as a baby, they all go to those set of planets. It's not that everybody is forced to serve um, Krishna with Radharani. There's someone who likes to wrestle with Krishna as a friend. So he goes to that set of planets where Krishna is seven year old. Hmm? That set of planets where Krishna is serving Mother Yashoda, Mother Yashoda is serving Krishna, they go there. Depending on our inclination. Some like baby Krishna, hmm? some like to be friends with Krishna, and some like Radha and Krishna. So depending on our inclination, we go there. Just like if you have a ticket to Baltimore, you don't, uh, you know, go to Florida. Very specific. So it's not just Goloka Brindavan. It's where, depending on our natural inclination. Hmm? It's like saying, Goloka Brindavan is like saying United States of America. But where in the U.S. are you going, for example? So Rupa Goswami says we have to develop that, you know, by chanting and hearing for years and lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Our original position of being Krishna's servant will rise automatically. We don't have to do an, any extra endeavor. By chanting and serving Vaishnavas, all the exalted devotees, mm -hmm. they realize that some are friends with Krishna or you know, they have their different moods depending on Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu. So we go there. So Krishna drops like this. And as he comes into this material plane, still it's not easy. Because there are innumerable material planes. And each material universe has one earth. And each earth has uh, Dwarka, Mathura and Vrindavan. Too technical? Am I pushing it too hard? Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Start something new for us. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we have different... Uh, universes. So each universe has Bhumandal, Earth, and each Earth has Dwarka, Mathura, and Vrindavan. So Earth 1, Earth 2, Earth 3, Earth 4, Earth 5, Earth infinity. Hmm. So Krishna appears here, and then he appears here, and then he appears here, then he appears here, then he appears here, then he appears here, just like through 12 Rashis, the 12 zodiac signs, the sun moves and comes back to the original zodiac sign at the end of one year. Similarly, at the end of one day of Brahma, Krishna moves through all the Brindavans in the material universe and comes back to the original one. So Krishna's appearance is indeed transcendental. Very, very confusing. And even when he manifests, it's like he manifests here and then he moves very quickly. So, here in, in Vrindavan, one Krishna has appeared. Next second, Vrindavan, two Krishnas appeared. Next second, it's um, 8.46 now. At this second, Shaitanya Mahaprabhu has, has appeared in some planet. At this second, Narasimha Dev has appeared in some planet. At this second, Vaman Dev has appeared in some planet. So every pastime of Krishna is constantly appearing in some universe or the other at the moment. 
So they are all eternal. It's almost inconceivable. Therefore, some disciples of Prabhupada say, now Prabhupada is into another universe where he is doing his preaching. Then after that, he will go into another universe. Like Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was once taking an evening walk and he saw the moon and he said, Kali Yuga has just begun on the moon and after this I am supposed to go there for preaching. So great Vaishnavas follow Krishna and just like Krishna is performing his pastimes even in the material plane, continuously from one planet to another, pure Vaishnavas also travel and assist Krishna in all of their pastimes. So therefore to understand Krishna's appearance is very very difficult. To understand Krishna's activities is very very difficult. Krishna is making that point here. That janma, karma, chame, divyam. My appearance and my activities are very, very transcendental and beyond the scope of mental catch. Sometimes we say, I want to understand God. Well, we cannot. Because the mind is so much and Krishna is infinite. How can the limited mind catch the infinite? Impossible. Therefore, the point of faith comes into picture. Faith in the heart does the impossible. Hmm? Like Krishna is unlimited, the mind is limited, the limited cannot catch the unlimited. But if you have faith and you serve the unlimited, the unlimited makes himself accessible to the limited. Is that understandable? Yeah. Like for example, a child cannot climb onto the shoulders of a seven foot hmm, man. But if the man sits on his knees and lets the child climb over, then the child can. So this is why bhakti is so important. Because through our head and intellectual logical per perception and reception, we cannot catch Krishna. It's like many people try to catch him hmm, through the mind and through the senses. And some of them even try. They go like this. But Krishna is way beyond. So when they look into their palm, they don't find anything. And they go atheistic. Or some who believe God exists, they go to catch him. And then look into the palm and they become Buddhists. God exists, but God is nothing. It's because it's like a dwarf trying to touch the moon or a baby trying to climb the shoulder of a seven and a half ma foot man. But by service, by loving devotional service, what happens is that seven and a half foot man, he's overwhelmed and charmed by the innocence of the baby. So he agrees to come on his knees and become like a, like a horse, for example. And the baby can climb over. So on our accord, we cannot catch Krishna. Through our senses, we cannot catch Krishna. A prakrita vastu nahi prakrita gochar Veda purana kohe nirantar That all the Vedas, all the Puranas, they make this point that the limited cannot catch the unlimited. The finite cannot catch the infinite. The limited cannot catch the unlimited. But by serving the unlimited, by serving the infinite, by serving hmm, the unbound, the unlimited Sri Krishna, he, like that seven and a half footer man, comes onto his knees, makes himself accessible so that we can understand him. So Prabhupada makes this point, only the pure devotees can understand Krishna. Why? Because through their devoted service, Krishna has made himself accessible to the devotee. Otherwise, nobody can catch. You can have PhDs from different um, academic schools and then still be, a, you know, like an atheist. We had um, one interreligious conference where we had uh, <clears throat> professors come from really reputed schools, like, you know, really good educational institutes with PhDs. I know one professor who has a PhD in the poetry of Rupa Goswami. And he's an atheist. Can you imagine? I sat through his presentation and it was like jaw dropping. Your jaw will hit the ground. He knows more Rupa Goswami than all of us. Guess what? He's an atheist. So you can have all of this mental exercise. Like we just went through this listening of Krishna's disappearance and appearance. And it's beyond the mental ability. It's very difficult to comprehend. Those who try to force, saying that everything that exists can be caught by my mind. 
are failing to understand that the mind is limited while Krishna is unlimited. It's impossible to catch. But those who serve Krishna with love, that unlimited, that inconceivable, he comes on his knees and makes himself... I want to wrap up with two quick, sweet pastimes of Prabhupada on this point, and then you know we can wrap it up. Srila Prabhupada, once he came to a temple, and he looked at the deities while taking darshan, and he said, why do the deities look so thin and weak? Aren't you feeding them properly? So who would think so? You know, I mean, if you come to the deities, even if our mind thinks that they've become fat or thin or whatever, you would say, eh, come on, that's not possible. That's stone, that's brass, that's wood. Oh, you've become sentimental sahaji or whatever. <laughs> right? But Prabhupada, being a pure Vaishnav, he looked at the deities and he said, why do I feel that the deities have become very thin and weak? He went to the temple president. The temple president said, actually the temple is running low on funds. So we used to offer six offerings before. But because now we have no money, we are offering only four offerings a day for the last one month. Maybe that's the reason. Prabhupada said, I could tell because they are, the waist has become thin. In another temple, Prabhupada went and he looked at the deities and he said, why does Krishna have black circles? Why does he have black circles? Why, why does he mm, feel so weak and drowsy? The temple president said, well, black circles, he's black all over. <laughs> he's mega sham. Prabhupada said, no, he looks very weak and tired. Why? So the temple president said, actually, again, same. It's a different temple, but the same reason. He said, a temple is running low on funds. And the main sponsors, the big industrialists, they come after work at about 9.30 at night. So if they don't see the deities, how will they give the donation? So the deities who were shut, they, the curtains used to be put at 9 o'clock every night. We're keeping them awake till 10 o'clock. It's been going on for the last two months. Because we want all the industrialists and the businessmen and the capitalists to take darshan so that they can, they can offer a kind donation. Prabhupada said, I could tell. They have lost 60 hours of sleep, which means 60 days and one hour every day. He said, Krishna and Radharani, especially Krishna, has lost 60 hours of sleep. You got to put the deities off to sleep at the same time. So Prabhupada said for deity worship, cleanliness, punctuality, and the right way, method of worship. These are three things which are very important. So the point that I'm making is that, how is it that Prabhupada could speak to the deities? Because through his devotional service, that infinite, that inconceivable, that infallible Lord has come in the plane of visibility, in the plane of perception. So we started off our discussion with Janma Karma Chame Divyam. Krishna's activities, disappearance is transcendental. Five reasons. One, Durvasa Muni's curse that the lump of iron will destroy. Two, Vali. Vali, yes, the law of karma teaching the world. Three, Yes, Durvasa Muni again, sweet rice. Whenever you don't get a point, just say Durvasa. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> the sweet rice pastime. Fourth, Magic, Kritrim. And five, Krishna did that hmm, to bewilder the faithless. Because if Krishna just got onto a chariot and went on, just like you have Air India, hmm, <laughs> if Krishna gets onto Air Vaikuntha, for example, hmm, then everybody would see, this is God. He's jumping on an airplane and going back to the spiritual world. But if Krishna drops a body here as if there was death, then that will bewilder the atheists. Krishna is giving them a reason. Look, I am a mere model. But amidst that, those who have faith, those devotees are very rare. Yeah? If Krishna shows everyone that he is transcendental and everybody starts performing bhakti, what is so special among the devotees? But if Krishna is bewildering it, that look, I am actually a mere mortal, quote unquote. But the devotees said, nah, I know Kritrim. I know your make-believe, you know the story of the pot after pot, you know all of that. I know you're transcendent. Oh, those devotees are very rare and very special. So five reasons. Durvasa's Yadu Vamsha curse, hmm? Vali, 
sweet rice, Krishna, uh, Kritrim and uh, Krishna disappearing to bewilder the atheists. This was for the disappearance and for the appearance we had Tattva coming from Jiva Goswami and Vishwana Chakravarti. Even if we don't understand that, no problem. Hmm? Prabhupada said, understand that you cannot understand. <laughs> Just so that we understand how small we are in front of Krishna's transcendental position. And finally, we made this point that the infinite cannot be understood through the senses, but he makes himself accessible and understood hmm, through our service. When we perform deity worship, when we perform Nam Seva, we chant Krishna's name, when we hear Hari Katha, he who is inconceivable, then he can be seen, served, and understood. That's how, that's the method of transcendental loving service that Srila Prabhupada came to give, give the whole world, that that God that you cannot see, you can see him through service, through deity worship, through Harinam, hmm? through Bhagavad Shravan and the association of wonderful Vaishnavas like all of you. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Any, it's, it's nine o'clock, so not bad. The class was one hour. One minute. Sorry? One minute. One minute over? Till oh. Till nine. Oh, I see. My act has just begun. <laughs> you know, I just spoke for one minute and made you feel as if it was one hour. <laughs> that was Kritrim, by the way. <laughs> so, any questions, comments? Suggestions? Yes. Uh, yes, we can probably take Prabhu quick. Yes. Okay. Um, not related to, to the uh, lecture tonight. Uh -huh. uh, because uh, I wanted to see, uh, because I c I'm not clear about one thing. Um, Dhruva Maharaj. Mm -hmm. okay. When it is said that at the end of his life he was among sadhus meditating and then the plane came to pick him up. And it is said that as he was walking to the plank, he put his foot over Yama. So, mm. so my question is, did he enter this plane, a plane mm. in his body or did he leave his body? Mm -hmm. That is not clear for me. If he mm. entered the plane in his mat material, original body, mm. or he left and then got a new special as he is going, but already in the trust. Because it is said that at some point, his body became very rad radiant. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, uh, maybe I should do it a couple more times. Uh, but it's not clear if it became radiant because he left his body and became, and had his <laughs> original transcendental body, or that the material body somehow became. I asked the same question to my Gurudev when I was with him in Vrindavan, reading Bhagavatam. So I exactly know what the answer is. <laughs> Other places you can always speculate. You can say, well, I think so. But this is the same question I asked my Gurudev. I asked him, you know, did Dhruva Maharaj, you know, I asked him two questions. I said, one, did Dhruva Maharaj um, get on to the plane on his, with his material body or the spiritual body? And second, I asked him this question that Dhruva Maharaj and Prahlad Maharaj both had the same Guru, Narad Muni. But Prahlad Maharaj gets Vaikuntha, while Dhruva Maharaj gets stuck in the material plane with a pole star. Why? Both did bhajan, both performed devotional service, both had the same guru, and both are, you know, pure Vaishnavas. So why? So I'll put both of this in perspective. So he said that Dhruva Maharaj was forced by Yamaraj to give up the body. He said, you must give up your body here and take a new body and go in a transcendental body, that Dhruva Maharaj didn't agree to it. He said, this is the body I perform devotional service, and I will go like this. So the, the, the keeping his feet over the head of Yamaraj shows uh, disobedience in a positive way. That, you know, somebody who performs bhakti becomes so capable that, in fact, if he's ready, he can even go in the same body. So the answer is Dhruva Maharaj did go in the same body. Mm -hmm. He stepped over the head of Yamaraj, very rare case of someone to have gone to the spiritual abode with the same body in which he did bhakti. Like Narottam Das Thakur. Narottam Das Thakur never left behind a mortal body in this world. 
like Tukaram mm, from uh, Maharashtra. He, you know, Air Vaikunta came in and picked him up in the same body. Mm. So Dhruva Maharaj for sure went in the same body. He didn't leave behind a body. So the stepping over the head of Yamaraj shows that principle that even Yamaraj had to bow down. Okay, you don't want to give up your body, you want to go in the same body, no problem. Yeah, that's part one. Now part two, Prahlad Maharaj performs bhakti, Dhruva Maharaj performs bhakti, both have the same spiritual master. Prahlad Maharaj gets Vaikuntha and Dhruva Maharaj gets a Dhruva star. Why? So he said, both approached Guru with different intentions. Prahlad Maharaj approached Narad Muni not with his own ideas. He didn't go to his Gurudev saying, I want this, what can you do to get me this? Prahlad Maharaj went like an open vessel. Whatever you think is appropriate, fill in. Okay, Narasingadev, Tathastu. But Dhruva Maharaj went to Narad Muni saying, give me a process by which I can have a kingdom greater than my grandfather, great grandfather. Kachan vichinvan api divya ratnam swamin kritarthosmi varam nayachi. So you give me a process. So he's basically going to his guru that you give me a process by which I get what I want. But Prahlad Maharaj goes to his guru by saying, I don't know what I want. You give me, O oh Guru Dev, whatever is best for me. So it's not that Prahlad Maharaj and Dhruva Maharaj, like Prahlad Maharaj is better than Dhruva. No. Both are teaching us principles. Prahlad Maharaj is teaching us how to be, how to approach our spiritual master. Not going with our ideas. Spiritual master says, well, this is how it must be done. But Maharaj, I think this is better. Oh Maharaj, you may say this, but I think when the point where we think that I can actually advise, where actually my spiritual master can take my consultation, he can ask me. Very risky. So Dhruva Maharaj is not by nature like that, but he's teaching this profound principle to the whole world. That look, even if you perform bhakti, if you go with your own ideas to the spiritual master saying, Oh Guru Dev, Oh Guru Maharaj, you may give me advice, but this is what I want. But no, Prahlad Maharaj is teaching us no. Go and surrender completely. If we listen to our spiritual master 90% and disobey or disagree 10%, why are we agreeing 90%? Because that resonates with our thinking. But the remaining 10%, we disagree. I'm talking about a very exalted, mm, a bona fide spiritual master. We're not talking about, you know, we're talking about the four bona fide sampradays. We're not talking about who are always in controversy. So we have to go and ask very humbly, Tadvidi Pranipata Pariprashna Sevaya. That, oh Gurudev, this is how it is. So most of them may agree 70%, may not agree to 30%. Why they don't agree to that 30%? Because their logic resonates with their Guru 70%. But these 30, this 30%, they don't agree. So where is the point of surrender then? Surrender is when we are outside the comfort zone. In Hindi, sar means head. So true surrender means keeping our sir under Krishna's feet. Sir under. <laughs> you know, sir means the head. So surrender means sir under the feet of Guru in Krishna. So saranagati. Sharanagati. This sar also leads on. So, sharana means um, shelter and gati means to go. So, this is not sharana gati, sharana gati, which means a means enthusiasm hmm? and gati means to go and sharana means shelter. So, to enthusiastically go and take shelter is sharana gati, like that. So, uh, coming back, Dhruva did go in the same body. <laughs> yes, you can. So, uh, this question is, um, because it is said that we have eternal relationship with Lord Krishna, yeah? And um, 
when, when I was in Mayapur, we went to a place where, where there was a pastime with Lord Chaitanya King and um, I have bad memory for names. Uh, in that place... To Mother Parvati? No, 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 no. To one of... Uh, there is a tree and then a lot of sweet of uh -huh. Chaitanya. When he embra embraced the devotee, this is what happened. Uh -huh. Mayapur. You don't remember the name of the devotee? Uh, one of the many things that I don't remember. Uh, I forgot his name. But but the point was, uh, maybe later on I will. So my point is that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told him who he is. Mm -hmm. Told him his eternal relationship with mm -hmm. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mm -hmm. So my question is, we, how uh, should this be understood, that relationship with Lord Krishna, eternal? So, like you described, for each pastime of Krishna, one mm. or two and so on. Mm. Does it mean that my eternal relationship is one of those, or will it come to existence <coughs> based on my spiritual progress in this lifetime? So this is an ongoing eternal debate of whether the Swarup is inherited or whether it is acquired. That's the question, right? Fundamentally. Do you become someone on the basis of your chanting and hearing or do you reclaim your position? Yeah. yeah? This is a class of itself. It's a three hour discussion because there are Vaishnav, Vaishnav Acharyas commenting both ways. But very simply to what Prabhupada taught us. Prabhupada said, we all have a long-standing relationship with Krishna and by performing bhakti, that will be revealed automatically and then we'll reclaim our position. That is what Prabhupada taught us. So I just want to leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, so more than saying that uh, we can perform bhakti and get a form accordingly, my understanding in line of what Prabhupada taught us in his books is that we all have an eternal constitutional relationship with Krishna, which is eternal. And by performing bhakti, it's like Michelangelo, who was asked that, how do you make such good sculptures? He said, they actually exist within, and I just chip off the extra ones, the unwanted ones. So that's what uh, it's all about. We actually have that form within. And by performing bhakti, the extra things get chipped off, which is anartha nivrti, and that form gets manifested. So Prabhupada said, by performing chanting, hearing, and serving Vaishnavas, Hmm? Krishna will reveal our original form and we can serve Krishna. Hare Krishna. Just so, a technical question. Yes. When Hunter here pierced Krishna's feet, was it his toy or was it his heel? Because in some places he doesn't. Um, I think Vishwanath Chakravarti talks about the toe, but I've also have read readings where it says the heel yeah. of the feet. Yeah. yeah. So fundamentally, the um, the essence could be taken as the lotus feet. May not be able to be exactly sure which petal of the lotus was hit, but for sure the lotus was hit. Or it appeared as if the lotus was hit because it's Kritrim. Gaur Prevanande Jai Shishirada Gopi Vallabha Ki Jai.